Good morning. Praise the Lord. It's a good day. It's a blessed day. We are still in the land of the living by God's grace and God's grace alone. On yesterday, we talked about receiving power. Very important topic. And it's important that we understand it. That's why the Bible has repeatedly made something clear to us, especially in the New Testament. Jesus teaching his disciples one day told them that the spirit of truth, that's the Holy Spirit, ye know him, that's what he said, the spirit of truth, you know him. And then he said, for he dwelleth with you and then he said right behind that and shall be in you there's a difference and there's a distinction you know uh god has been with us from our birth and before when we were rebelling against god and uh doing everything we were big enough to do and walking in our own way. God was with us. He didn't condone it, but he was with us in order to draw us away from it, in order to bring us to repentance, in order to show us a better way. And he had long patience. He was with us. Otherwise, the devil would have cut you off. Otherwise, you would have given up. You would have been destroyed. God was with you. As a matter of fact, even when we first come to Christ, God is with us. The Spirit of God was with the disciples before the day of Pentecost. On the day of Pentecost, Jesus actualized what he was talking about when he said, the Spirit dwelleth with you and shall be in you. It moved to another realm on the day of Pentecost and after. See, they were different men. When the Spirit was with them, but they still felt like, let's call down fire from heaven and burn up these folk. <laughs> when, when, when the Spirit was with them, it, and it was with them, they were disciples of Jesus. Jesus claimed them. He was growing them. He was maturing them. But when the Spirit was just with them, they were ready, ready to pull out a sword and cut a man's head off. Only they missed and just got his ear. Uh, they, they were jealous of one another and arguing with one another. And, but the Spirit was with them because it was working with them to bring them to a certain point where it could infill them. And it's important for us to make the distinction because if we make it all the same, then we're running around believing something that's not reality. It is not true that everybody has the Spirit in them. I don't know who does. That's not my job. I don't judge that. I can't know. But everybody does not have the Spirit in them even though the spirit may be with them and they may be doing church work and they, they may seem to be a good person and they may be striving and just like the disciples were. But there is a difference and we need to know that. Pentecost started something new, the spirit in them in a mighty way, in a manifested way. And by the way, if the spirit's in you, you're going to live like that. The spirit will manifest itself if it's in you. I said, if it's, if it's in you, it has control. You don't have control of it. Oh, you make the choices. But the spirit in you brings you into perfect harmony with the will of God. And God works in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. It's a difference. There was a difference in the disciples after the day of Pentecost. Period. Period. There was a difference. And so now today's topic is suffering to become and suffering because of. Hmm, what does that mean? Let's pray. Our Father, which art in heaven, we thank you for your word. We thank you for awakening us and working with us and blessing us and grooming us so that you can make us your permanent dwelling place but you fit us first and you count us as your own 
Wow, you're fitting us. Oh, what a blessing. We love you. We praise you. Fill us, Lord, with your spirit, the fullness of the Holy Ghost. Fill us, Lord. Let us not be blind, but open our eyes. That's the problem with the church in the last day. You said it. They're blind. They believe stuff that's true that's not true. They believe that they are in a spirit, spiritual condition that they're not in. They're wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. They think they're filled with the Holy Ghost. They, they think they are doing God's will. They think they're heavenward bound. They, they think they know the truth. And they think all of that. When Jesus says that the real condition is what you don't know is that you're wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. Help mm -hmm. us, Lord, this we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, saints, let's, let's begin to, to, to dig into what we are going to talk about today. Suffering to become and suffering because of. Let's, let's read uh, Philippians chapter 3 and verses 10 through 12. That I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death. If by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead, not as though I had already attained, either were already perfect, but I follow after, if that I may apprehend that for which also I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. The apostle speaks about knowing God and the power of his resurrection. Oh, what a blessed experience. But right behind that, he says, and the fellowship of his suffering, which makes us conformable unto his death. Listen, folk, uh, suffering, suffering. Who likes to suffer other than nobody? Who enjoys suffering? Who, who, who desires it? Who prays to the Lord saying, Lord, let me suffer. And listen, Paul, who walked with God, who had deep experiences in the things of God, who was taken up to the third heaven, he said, and shown things that, was, that it was unlawful for him to tell and talk about. That man says, I don't count myself to have apprehended. See, I'm not perfect. Uh, I'm not going to claim I'm perfect. Even if I was, I'd be like Job. I wouldn't know it. Only thing he says he does is follow after. He continues to walk in the pathway of Jesus. And here's the truth. Listen to me. There's always room for growth. Mm. Even when one is perfectly purified, there's still room for growth. Mm -hmm. When we enter heaven and eternity, we will grow in knowledge, in spirit in every way we will grow throughout the ceaseless ages of eternity we will never get to the point where we're fully to the point where we can't grow anymore there will always be growth there's always room for expansion that's the kind of god we serve but i want to highlight from this text it talks about the fellowship of his sufferings oh what kind of fellowship is that james chapter one verses Two, three, and four says what, Dolores? My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. But let patience have her perfect work, that ye may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. Count it all joy when you fall into temptations, uh, when you're suffering, uh, when you are afflicted. Why? The text gives the reason why. Knowing that the trying of your faith worketh patience, and you let patience have her perfect work. And here's the, the goal, that you may be perfect and entire, fully reflecting the character of God, wanting or lacking nothing. That's why you count it joy. Not because you love pain, but because... God is perfecting you so that you are entire and complete, lacking nothing. Therefore, you count it all joy. God is working in you. It's a blessing. Help us, Lord. It's a blessing. You know, uh, the disciples after Pentecost, 
after the spirit was in them, not just with them, when the spirit was just with them, they were ready to kill somebody. I didn't mm -hmm. say they did it. <laughs> they were ready to fight, argue and fight with each other. Spirit was with them. It was grooming them and bringing them to repentance and, and molding them. And Jesus claimed them as his own. They were covered with the righteousness of Christ when the spirit was just with them. Okay. So, so that's a reality. But Jesus told them that you're going to grow to the point where I will actually indwell you. The spirit of God, the spirit that rolled out the heavens like a scroll, that's going to live in you. And in the person of that spirit is the person of Jesus who created all things. And in the person of Jesus is the person of God, the father. All right. That's a big deal. And that's what we want. But these disciples after Pentecost, after they were filled with the spirit, they had a, a, a different uh, uh, attitude and, and response to suffering and pain. Let's look at it. Acts chapter five, verses 38 to 41. And now I say unto you, refrain from these men. And let them alone. For if this counsel or this work be done of men, it will come to naught. But if it be of God, ye cannot overthrow it, lest happily ye be found even to fight against God. And to him they agreed. And when they had called the apostles and beaten them, they commanded that they should not speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. And they departed from the presence of the council, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name here these men are being mistreated put in jail and beaten for no reason and then they beat them and give them a command mm -hmm. don't you say anything about jesus anymore mm -hmm. and they reinforce that with a good beating mm -hmm. that's mistreatment that was not fair that was not right. That was not justice. They suffered because they were doing right. Mm -hmm. The title of our uh, message today is suffering to become and suffering because of. We suffer in order to be groomed to be like God. He sands and fouls us and, and uh, scrubs away the sin, the, the faultiness. That's why you suffer. But then on the other hand, when you are becoming or become in certain aspects, then you suffer because of it. You're not going to get around to suffering. <laughs> mm -hmm. Just forget about it. Listen, folks, let me tell you a reality. There's a conflict, an irrepressible conflict between good and evil, between right and wrong, between righteousness and unrighteousness between light and darkness, just by virtue of the nature of what they are, means that there's a conflict. Light and darkness cannot dwell in the same place. One will immediately eviscerate the other if it's present. You go into a dark room, flip the light switch, it eviscerates the darkness. It, they can't just dwell together. That's not the nature of it. And there's a conflict between God and Satan. And you're in that conflict. That's why suffering is on the table. If you live for God and you are reflecting God and you love the Lord and you're a child of God, the forces of evil are set in array, array against you to pervert you, to make you fall, to make you miserable. But when these things come upon you, it's proof of something. We're going to look at another text, another few texts on this. Therefore, you rejoice. You know that God is purifying you and perfecting you. We need to leave the line today with a new outlook on suffering. Mm -hmm. I don't care what it comes from, where it comes from, and how long it lingers. God, as we're going to read in a little bit, is doing it and allowing it for your profit. And that's why these disciples could walk away from vicious, unfair treatment, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer for the name of Jesus. They weren't suffering because they had lied and shot somebody or robbed somebody. They were suffering because they did right. Mm -hmm. Suffering because of. Lord, help us. Even in the Beatitudes, when, when Jesus is teaching his disciples of the principles, about the principles of God's kingdom, he says in Matthew chapter 5 and verses 10 through 12, Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. 
Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceeding glad for great is your reward in heaven. For so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. Rejoice and be exceeding glad. That's a command. But it's a command that cannot work itself out unless, of course, the spirit is in you. In you. Otherwise, you, will don't, you don't even have the capacity to do that. Yeah. The ability, you, you will not do it. Even if you grit your teeth and endure, you're not going to be exceeding glad. That's just all it is to it. Rejoice and be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven. And listen, uh, it seems not to make real good sense. <laughs> Blessed, Jesus says, you're blessed. You're blessed when you're persecuted for righteousness' sake, when you are treated bad because you did right. When you are persecuted because you did the will of God, you're blessed. He says, you are blessed when men revile you. That's a hard thing. And persecute you and say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake you're blessed you're blessed they might be saying that they're church members but there's a different spirit in them and they give you a hard time you still have to love them oftentimes you still have to try to work with them and bring them to repentance but god says as far as the suffering goes rejoice and be exceeding glad for great is your reward in heaven they persecuted all the prophets they persecuted jesus yes, yes. not because he did wrong but because he did right because he had a spirit and a power about him that they did not possess they didn't like him they hated him there is that's evidence of that irrepressible conflict between god and satan between light and darkness between right and wrong between good and evil is there is there and it will be until we leave this old wicked world, God says to us. And let's let's take this to heart. First Peter chapter 4 and verses 12 through 14. What does it say, Dolores? Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened unto you, but rejoice in so much as ye are partakers of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory shall be revealed, you may be glad also with exceeding joy if ye be reproached for the name of Christ. Happy are ye, for the spirit of glory and of God resteth upon you. On their part, he is evil spoken of, but on your part, he is glorified. Uh, that set of scriptures bring out a very important reality. Lord, write it in our hearts and in our minds so that we can live it. Mm. Don't think it's strange when the fiery trials come your way. They may be many and frequent, but don't think it's a strange thing. God commands you, but rejoice. You need the indwelling of the Holy Ghost. Rejoice in as much as you are partakers of Christ's suffering. It happened to him, and he was God in the flesh. It happened to him, and he was sinless, no faults. It happened to him and he was perfect love. He loved everybody from his heart, soul, and mind and, and, and expressed it to them. Yet he suffered. And that's why God says, uh, if ye be reproached for the name of Christ, happy are ye. And then it says this, for the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. That spirit rests upon you. That's why you're suffering. You're reflecting righteousness. You're reflecting Christ. Therefore, you're suffering. Thus, you are sharing in the sufferings of Christ. The same reason he suffered, that's the same reason you're suffering. You're reflecting holiness. And the devil hates you because you are a reflection of Jesus. And he sets out to make your life miserable. And the way you respond to these sufferings also is a testimony and a sermon to others. Content peace in the midst of the storm help us lord so now when the spirit of god's glory that's his character and of god himself rests upon you if he's in you then 
it's true that the spirit of God rests upon you because he's in you. <laughs> when, when you're suffering because of that, you need to rejoice. You need to be happy. Help us, Lord. Hebrews chapter 12, verses 2 through 6. What does it say there, Dolores? Looking, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye be wearied and faint in your minds. Ye have not resisted unto blood, striving against sin, and ye have forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as unto children. My son, despise not thou the chastening of the Lord, yes. nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth and scourgeth son. Every son. Scourgeth every son whom he down. receiveth. All right. Now, that's important. It's so important. Whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. God oftentimes has to give his children a little spanking. You know how you did your children, those of us who are parents, from time to time? It was needful. It was for their good. You're not mad with them and punishing them and just trying to abuse them. No, it's for their good. It's to teach them this is the wrong way. Don't do this. It'll hurt you. It'll destroy you. You're not getting the message. What? I, so I need to reinforce it a little bit. Whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth. Mm -hmm. That's a sign of God's love. The Bible says, if ye be without chastisement, then are ye bastards. That's illegitimate children. Your children are the devil. Mm -hmm. But whom the Lord loves, he chastens. So don't faint in your heart. Mm -hmm. As a matter of fact, it highlights something else here. We have not gone through anything remotely close to what Jesus went through. Mm -hmm. And then the Bible says, consider him who endured such contradictions of sinners against himself. Consider Jesus, lest you be weary and faint in your mind. Mm -hmm. You haven't gone through even a drop in the bucket when you compare it with what your Savior went through. It says, ye have not yet resisted unto blood, striving against sin. Jesus sweated blood. He literally sweated blood, striving against sin. You haven't done it. God doesn't allow it to come upon you in a fierce way like that. And so God is telling us, don't despise the chastening of the Lord. Yeah, hard times come and difficult times come and confusing times come. But God tells you, don't faint. Don't faint. Don't faint. I love you. And I, everybody who I receive, I rebuke and I chase them. I, I'm working to, to save them. Let's look at it in Hebrews uh, chapter 12, verses 7 through 11. What does it say there? If you endure chastening, God dealeth with you as sons. For what son is he whom the Father chasteneth not? But if ye be without chastisement, whereof all are partakers, then are ye bastards and not sons. Furthermore, we have had fathers of our flesh which corrected us, and we gave them reverence. Shall we not much rather be in subjection unto the Father of spirits and live? For they verily for a few days chastened us after their own pleasure, but he for our profit, that we might be partakers of his holiness. Now, no chastening for the present seemeth to be joyous, but grievous. Nevertheless, Afterward, it yieldeth the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. Praise the Lord. Now, those words are so clear. The Bible points out that uh, if ye endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with children, his children, his sons, his daughters. It points out that all are partakers. Nobody's exempt. If you don't experience chastening, the chastening of the Lord, then you're illegitimate, you're bastards. Mm -hmm. You're not children of God. Yes, huh? And then it says, he does it for our profit, that we might be partakers of his holiness. He's trying to move the spirit 
from being with you to in you. In you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Let's get it straight. Help us, Lord. Yes. yes. We've been thinking the other way for so long that we we just automatically say, oh, yeah, the Spirit's in you. It might be, or it may not be. And Jesus said that's the problem with the last church. It's not in them, but they think it is. Claiming it is. Telling everybody else it is. The Bible says that no chastening for the present seemeth to be joyous, but grievous. So let's just realize that that's the, that's the case. It's not a joyful thing. It seems to be grievous. Nevertheless, afterward, it yieldeth the peaceable fruits of righteousness to them that are exercised thereby. It's for your profit. God says it's for your profit. Hebrews chapter 2 and verses 9 through 12. What does it say there? But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. For it became him for whom all are all things and by whom are all things in bringing many sons unto glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. For, for both he that sanctifieth and they who are sanctified are all of one. For which cause he is not ashamed to call them brethren, yes. saying, I will declare thy name unto my brethren, in the midst of the church will I sing praise unto thee. We are all one in Christ. We are part of Christ. Help us, Lord. He is not ashamed to call us brethren. The Bible says here in these texts that Jesus was made for suffering, for the suffering of death. He was made humankind so that he could suffer and pay the price of death, eternal death, for all humankind. He was made perfect through suffering. That's what the Bible says. Mm -hmm. The same with us. We are made perfect through suffering. Mm -hmm. A perfect character is developed through suffering. Mm -hmm. Jesus took on our sins and through suffering, he did for us what we could not do for ourselves. Mm -hmm. He developed a perfect character that he will impart into us. But mm -hmm. we do not become perfect except for through suffering. Mm -hmm. And that's a reality. And we need to keep it in mind. God makes a promise in Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 13, 11 and 12. What does it say? And I will punish the world for their evil and the wicked for their iniquity. And I will cause the arrogancy of the proud to cease and will lay low the haughtiness of the terrible. I will make a man more precious than fine gold, even a man than the golden wedge of Ophir. Oh, that's the promise of God. I will make a man. He individualizes it. It's applicable to you personally. I will make a man more precious than fine gold. Yeah, the character perfected. He said, I'll do this. I'll do this. I'm going to punish the world for the evil, but I'm going to make you who trust me, who exercise the faith of Jesus, who endure chastening. I'm going to make you more precious than fine gold, a, 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 a fit vessel to dwell with me throughout the ceaseless ages of eternity, who will share my throne. Yes, yes. <laughs> and who will rule the universe with me. Have mercy. Listen, folk. This thing of suffering, uh, we'll talk about with some frequency all throughout this year. But we've got to have a new perspective on it. Jesus says, bless it when you're persecuted. For righteousness sake, for my name's sake, when people lie on you, or say all manner of evil against you falsely, you're blessed. And then it says when you were enduring all kind of trials and tribulations, count it all joy. Rejoice. You know why? Because God is perfecting you for heaven. Furthermore, you are reflecting God's character. You are reflecting God's holiness and glory. Therefore, the forces of evil are set in ray against you. Lord, help us. 
Let's pray. Our Father and our God, bless us. Impart your spirit after you prepare us into us that we might fully reflect your glory. And then, Lord, when you impart your spirit, your character, your fullness, your power into us, then more than ever, we will experience the sufferings of Christ. The Bible talks about the fellowship of his suffering. And, oh, Lord, make us like the disciples of old. They rejoiced that they were counted worthy to experience the same type of suffering Jesus experienced. And they knew that they were experiencing it because they, reflecting, they were reflecting the character and power of Jesus. Make that our reality, Lord. We love you. We praise you. It is in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. All right, saints.